a very brief history of the Catholic Church. Christianity starts with Christ. Literally. Well, actually it started with Mary saying yes to God and agreeing to give him human life in the first place. The little Tacker spent nine months there before actually coming into the world. His life was a radical model of faithful self-sacrifice which combined spectacular miracles with precision teaching, landing him on a Roman cross. In excellent news, he came back to life and ascended to heaven. This left his followers with a church to run. We call this period Christ's earthly ministry, and it lasted from about 4 BC to about 30 AD. Next came the Apostolic Period, named as such because it was the period during which Christ's original disciples, the Apostles, lived, preached, and did a fairly cracking job of spreading the church. Leading the way were Peter, the first Pope, and James. However, perhaps the most influential character was a latecomer, Paul. After meeting Jesus in a vision, he became the most enthusiastic disciple ever. So much so, he scores the honorary title Apostle also. Not all was rosy, and in the year 50, the first proper Barney was settled at the Council of Jerusalem. Up to this point, all of Jesus' followers had been Jewish, but Paul argued that Christ was for everyone, even those stinky Gentiles. His side won. Christianity soon differentiated itself from Judaism, and church numbers boomed. That said, lots of dying happened too. Eleven of the twelve apostles plus Paul were killed for their faith. The apostolic period ended in about 100 when the lucky bugger, the apostle John, died an old man. Sometimes called the post-apostolic period, the period of persecution was 200 years of pretty hard slog, or getting slogged in the head as was the case for many. In the Roman Empire, it was cool to worship your own god, so long as you also worshipped Caesar. This was tough for Christians, and Jews for that matter, who flat out refused. Well, the first commandment is pretty clear on this point. So, lots were killed. Martyred, it's called. However, despite this, or perhaps because of this, the church continued to grow and strengthen. When membership could equal death, very few wimps joined. There were some wonderful stories from this period of barbecued saints, but another time. It was surprising for many in the church then, when in 313, Emperor Constantine declared Christianity legal. His mum was a Christian and he just won control over the whole Roman Empire at the Battle of Milvian Bridge after seeing a vision of Christ's cross. Suffice to say, the isolated pockets of Christian churches scattered around the empire who were previously left to their own devices were, for the first time, able to meet up. So they argued. Not a little argument, a big one. Who was this Jesus character anyway? Was he God or man or both? Constantine wasn't going to stand for this fighting, so he called a council. The Council of Nicaea. There you go. He's both fully God and fully man. Well, the Christian church took four councils to finally confirm what scripture had said all along, but they got there, unfortunately losing a few eastern churches along the way. In the meantime, the church grew, and with the help of Roman cash, it built magnificent churches. Unfortunately, this growth also came with increased political power. So we can call this the birth of the institutional church. After Rome fell, the church became even more powerful. While there were lots of saints who kept the truth and spread the gospel, there were also corruptions emerging. During the period of the Holy Roman Empire, yep, that's different from the Roman Empire, bishops were appointed by kings, not the Pope. These positions came with great wealth and power. In 1054, the Eastern Church split from the Western Church after a bust-up concerning the Holy Spirit, the role of the Pope, and how much yeast should be in the bread. We call this the East-West Schism. Notable excellent fella St. Francis of Assisi lived in the 1200s and inspired a return to holiness in many Christians. But by October 1517, tensions and abuses of power had built up again to an explosive point, an act of defiance by Martin Luther, a German priest, and a subsequent protest over authority exploded into a full-blown theological barney. Luther wouldn't recant, so he was sent packing. The church shattered into literally thousands of parts or denominations, and this cataclysmic event was called the Protestant Reformation, and it's the reason there are still Baptists and Anglicans and Lutherans in the uniting church today. Many in the Catholic Church, because we now needed a name to distinguish ourselves from all the others, figured it was a time to return to the truth. Saint Ignatius focused on training priests so they could preach properly, and Saint Teresa of Avila founded the Carmelite Order, and a string of quality popes sorted out the leadership, taking away many of the political perks of high office and calling the massive Council of Trent to sort out the theology. 
This period was successful in dragging us back to the gospel and is sometimes called the Counter-Reformation. By 1965, modernism had reduced the political and social power of the church, at least in the Western world. In an attempt to both embrace the gospel message anew and to communicate our tradition better with the modern world, the bishops met at the Second Vatican Council. Out of this council emerged the church you know today, faithful to tradition and open to the world. There were 1.2 billion Catholics and up, all up 2.18 billion Christians in the world today. Not bad, apostles. The question is, what's next for our church? Remember that it all started back in the major.